This is FRM Part 2, Book 2, Credit Risk Measurement and Management, and two chapters on securitization. The good news for you guys is that we've talked about many of the topics inside of these two chapters. There will be some new topics that we'll have to focus on, but this could be considered really just a summary of much of the focus in you know, the last 10 or 12 chapters that we've talked about. You'll see what I mean when we go through these learning objectives. Look at some of the bolded phrases inside of these learning objectives. Describe securitization process, collateral, cash waterfall, special purpose vehicles, credit enhancements, subprime mortgage. You know, so we've talked about these topics before. The focus of this chapter will be just a little bit different than what we've done in the past. So we'll have to focus on uh, those subtleties and nuances, but then look uh, a little more than halfway down, delinquency ratio, default ratio, monthly payment rate. We'll do a little bit of math and we'll make sure that we know all of those uh, definitions. I mean, look at these action words, define, explain, analyze. Now there is a define and calculate for that delinquency ratio. And I have a couple of slides to show you the mathematics behind it, but it's, it's really just a matter of uh, computing weighted averages. So let's go ahead and get started with a basic definition of securitization. And this definition at that block point at the top is taken right, right out of the chapter. It's a sale of assets which generate cash flows from the institution that owns them to another company that has been specifically set up for the purpose and the issuing of notes by this second company. Look at all the commas in that sentence. In fact, when I was in the eighth grade, I had an English teacher who, who taught us how to diagram sentences. And that was one of my favorite things to do as an eighth grader. But if she asked us to diagram this sentence, I would have probably scratched my head and said, there are too many commas in there and it's not even a sentence. Anyway, let me give you a little bit more of a streamed line example so that this securitization made sen makes sense. You probably know that I love talking about my family. I have three sons. Let's suppose I have these three sons and one is interested in monster trucks. One is interested in PlayStation video games and one is interested in art. And all three of my boys excel in these areas so much so that they have their own YouTube channel. And combined, they generate, let's say $10,000 a month in income. One does 2,000, one does 5,000, one does 3,000. There's the 10,000 a month. So that's $120,000 a year. And so we've got this cash flow coming into the household. And suppose that my wife and I uh, would like to take a long vacation. And so we want to securitize the assets that we have. Maybe, the, maybe our sons are not the assets, but clearly their ability to generate income is an asset. So what I do is I can package those three YouTube channels and put it into a big wheelbarrow, a big, uh, a big fund, and I can sell it to an investor. And suppose I promise to transfer those cash flows to the investor and I can sell it to that investor today. And so what's that? $120,000 a year. Uh, let's see, 10%, if that's a perpetuity, what does that do? That gets me up to 1.2 million. And let me do some discount factor of what, 60%. So let's suppose I can sell this for 10 years for $750,000. So what happens? I raise this capital, $750,000. My wife and I, we can go on some fantastic vacation now using that 750,000. And all I have to do is all I have to maintain the original asset, right? So I need to tell my three sons, look, for the next 10 years, you guys need to uh, continue uh, monitoring and expanding your YouTube channel. Now, the cool thing about this is that I, I may not promise my investors 10000 a month. I may only promise them $9,000 a month. Anyway, so that's what securitization. I'm taking an asset and I'm turning it into cash today and making those cash flows kind of skip over me as the parent and go directly to the investor. So look at this flow chart here. So we have the asset owner, that would be me or the bank, right? We have a special purpose vehicle. Now I didn't say anything about that in my example, but that special purpose vehicle is exactly what the name suggests. So we've talked about this many, many times. You know, it's kind of its own separate entity. So I put the assets, you know, my son's 
three YouTube channels, or if we're a financial institution, I put some mortgages in there, and then I sell them over to the capital market investors. Yeah, so notice what happens in the rust colored and the orange colored. So asset transfer from the originator to the special purpose vehicle. So the special purpose vehicle now owns those assets, which means that there are different rules of bankruptcy for the special purpose vehicle and the financial institution. So look at the orange there. The SPV issues these asset backed securities to the investors and they can be divided into different classes or different tranches. And look at the purple there over on the right. It can be a senior tranche, can be some junior tranches, which a lot of times are called mezzanine tranches. And then the final tranche, which is the most risky tranche, it's always called the equity tranche because look at what we're doing here. You know, we're taking these fixed income securities like, like a mortgage, right? And we're turning it into something that it kind of looks like a mortgage, but because of the cash flows can be divided between and among different kinds of classes with different levels of risk, you know, that highest risk one looks an awful lot like a share of stock, and that's why it's called equity. One of those learning outcomes asks us for the benefits of securitization from both, here, let me do it, go back here, from both the financial institution all the way over on the left, and then the capital market investors over all the way over on the right. Um, and these are probably pretty important to remember. Um, from the bank's perspective, diversify the funding mix, mix, right? What does a bank do except deposits? So it can, it can accept, you know, checking accounts and savings accounts and certificates of deposits and short-term notes and long-term notes and bonds and equity, right? But what this does is it brings in a different class of investors who are searching for specific types of exposure. So diversify funding mix, that's probably important. And also reduce the cost of funding. I mean, let's face it, if I, if I want to issue a 30-year bond to finance the issuance of a bunch of mortgages, right? I'm going to have to pay, assuming we have an upward sloping yield curve, I'm going to have to pay a high coupon rate or a high yield to maturity. And then that eats into the profitability on the left-hand side of my balance sheet. So if I sell it to investors who want specific exposure, except, uh, instead of just a regular old bondholder who wants bank exposure, now I have an investor who wants specific exposure to a monster truck YouTube channel. That investor is probably willing to pay more for it, which means the cost of funding goes down. And that second one, the second circle point there is probably important as well, because remember, as a financial institution, we're subject to all sorts of laws and regulations. And so these regulators, they look at our balance sheet and they look down at the bottom right and they see what is your equity? What is your capital? And by using these special purpose vehicles, we can transfer some of our assets away. Remember, this is off balance sheet financing so that we can make our balance sheet look stronger. Uh, reduced credit ri risk exposure. Of course, this is all part of the identify risk, quantify risk, and manage risk. So we've done the first part, identify. We've done the second part, we've quantified. Now we're managing it. And so what we're doing is we're just saying, you know what, I'd, I'd like someone else to take this risk. We're transferring, we're reducing our credit risk exposure. Now from the investor standpoint, um, back in the academic world, we call, we call this spanning, right? So in the old sense of the word, investors could either pick money market securities, fixed income securities, or equity securities. You know, they had three choices, but spanning means that there are different chops in between all of those. So look at that first circle point, uh, assets that would otherwise not be open to them, like a credit card receivable. This gives them unique investment opportunities and attractive risk return profiles because they're buying only those exposures from the bank that they want, that they demand. And as I said before, they're willing to pay a higher price for that so that the yield and the cost of funding is less. Now, one thing I want you to be careful of, and maybe this is not just uh, um, for exam purposes, but you know, just kind of general awareness purposes, 
is that lots of times uh, the benefits of diversification are always mentioned in, in this kind of a description. And I just want to caution you that there are same, some things that are like over diversification, which really don't pay off or maybe kind of useless diversification, diversifying just for the sake of diversifying. So you can get in trouble there with diversification, but as long as it, as long as it maintains the original Harry Markowitz risk uh, expected return trade-off, then diversification is fine, but just be careful about over diversification. Uh, here's kind of a different flow chart and diagram on the securitization process from what we had before. Um, notice up in the uh, dotted box, we have the financial institution and then the assets that get thrown into the special purpose vehicle. But what we need is we need someone to pay attention to the special purpose vehicle, right? We can't just as the financial institution, put it over there and then not ever have to worry about it. We have to service it. Uh, we have to have trustees. We need to worry about credit enhancements. And then ultimately we need to worry about those investors down on the bottom right. And so we can issue, you know, A and B and C and any, any kinds of, uh, any kinds of letters that we want and go from A all the way to Z if we really wanted them to. Although Z sounds probably like too many. And so if you look at this slide, here's kind of a summary of what went on in that previous slide being able to identify the parties. So there's the originator. That's the, that's probably the financial institution. They put up, they create this special purpose vehicle. It could be a trust. It could be a, a, a corporation. I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Of course, on the left-hand side of the balance sheet for financial institutions, these are all the loan customers. And what do they do when they borrow money for a house or a car or a credit card? they sign something that says, I promise to repay, right? And then there's a servicer. Think about this. Someone has to collect all of those interest and principal payments and then make them available to the investors all the way on the right hand side. Here, let me go back here, right down at the bottom right, make that interest and principal payment available to those investors. That's called the servicer. And uh, it's probably going to be the original financial institution. And then of course, let me go back here real quickly. Look at the, the oval on the right there, the rust one credit enhancements then get thrown into the special purpose vehicle. Credit enhancements are those things that lower the default risk or the counterparty risk of that special purpose vehicle. You know, those include things like asking an insurance company to guarantee payment or using collateral. Those of you who listened to me before will know I love using that Pink Panther diamond as collateral. And then there's the underwriter who, you know, you need really smart people to try to figure out. Let me go back here real quickly. You need smart people to figure out, you know, what are the best number of A and B and C? How can we divide these tranches to attract those specific investors who are going to be willing to pay a premium for our services. And then the ratings agencies come in and they look at all this stuff and they say, OK, uh, let me look at this pool of mortgages up at the top. And if these pool of mortgages consist of people like like Jim, let's just take Jim. You know, Jim is 58 years old now and he's been an associate professor of finance for a thousand years. Um, he's paid off every debt that he's ever had in his entire life. His mortgage payment is this compared to his asset base and income of this. Let's suppose there are a hundred people like Jim in this mortgage pool. Well, then, then Moody's or Fitch are going to come in and say, you know what? That's probably AAA rated. Three different structures that your chapter tells you about in terms of special purpose vehicles and the difference between the inflows and then the outflows. And so for mortgage-backed securities, it makes perfect sense to have some type of amortizing structure because as you guys know, being good homeowners, you pay a fixed monthly payment. Part of that is interest, part of that is principal, and that changes over the life of the mortgage. Of course, early on, you pay huge chunks of interest, and then later on, you pay huge uh, chunks of principal. 
And so these amortization structures, which are just really passed through. So, right, what's happening is that the special purpose vehicle receives my interest in my, uh, my principal payment and then takes that and then sends it off to the investors. A revolving structure is probably not appropriate for mortgages, but might be more appropriate for maybe a car loan and a credit card receivable because here, let me go back here just quickly. You know, when you when when you take out a mortgage loan, let's say 30 years, you know, you're very sensitive to the interest rate. You know, a change in just a half percent of an interest rate can dramatically affect the total interest payment over 30 years. But, you know, this is why auto uh, manufacturers encourage their dealers to offer, you know, one percent financing or zero percent financing because over a four or five year period, of course, you're going to pay interest, but you're not going to pay the amount of interest that you do in a mortgage, right? So, so those are those are uh, less important. The amortization st uh, structure is less applicable to auto loans and credit card receivables because, you know, look at someone like me. I try to I try to pay my credit card balance is off every month and although when we buy cars i don't pay off the auto loan early but what we have done is fortunately we've had an accident that the car was totaled and nobody was hurt but then you know that loan then gets repaid you know somehow earlier so what the revolving structure does and this is pretty interesting you know think about someone like me who pays off the credit cards every month so let's just suppose my monthly bill is a thousand dollars, and you bought you bought this uh, asset-backed security based on my credit card receivable. So you're looking at a thousand dollars. You're thinking, okay, thousand dollars. All right, I'm going to earn lots of interest on this, but I pay it off every month. And so, what do you want? Do you want to be paid that one thousand dollars immediately, or do you want it to be lent out to somebody else who may not? pay that credit card balance every month, of course. So that's what the revolving structure means. Look at the top, purchase of new assets. That just means finding someone in, to replace Jim who's not going to pay the balance every month. And then a master trust is a really interesting case in which the originator uh, takes um, a huge amount of receivables. You know, let's suppose it's uh, let's suppose it's a hundred million dollars, right? And puts them into a special purpose vehicle. And once that special purpose vehicle is created, and we attract investors, we don't sell and try to raise a hundred. What did I say? A hundred million? Maybe we only sell eighty million or ninety million. All right. So notice what that first block point: a huge chunk of receivables that's much larger than the size of the funding. So if you look at the, you know, the little picture down at the bottom right there, this master trust, we have issue one and two and three and four and five, and then some residual assets here. And this is one way one way to manage risk. Quick slide here on the difference between a trust and a corporation. Notice important there, US, they can only be set up as trusts, which means that the special purpose vehicle then uh, means that the, the, the investors, the bondholders are represented by trustees, but with the corporate form, and this only happens in Europe, um, they're controlled by the board of directors who can actually sign contracts. So just remember differences between US and Europe uh, laws. Now we've done a cash waterfall before. Let's go ahead and do this, you know, kind of quickly. And this is really an interesting slide as well, but it's a good summary of some of the things that we've talked about in the past. Let, let's suppose that we have uh, some mortgage backed security and so what's happening? So all these people are paying their interest and their principal every month. So this flows into one big old pool. I always think of it as a wheelbarrow. And so what happens? There are fees associated with the special purpose vehicle, right? So we pay the trustee, we pay the administrative fees, we pay the legal fees, right? And then if there's anything left over, which, oh my gosh, I sure hope there is, especially if this is the first monthly payment, then we pay interest to the senior investors. Now, let's suppose that the interest that we received is 10, 
right? And so what could happen? We may owe the class A seniors, maybe we owe them six. So we pay them six and then we have something left over. So that takes us over to the left, to the green. But let's suppose that uh, we collect 10 and we owe them 15. So now what? Now, oh my gosh, now we fail. So what happens then if we fail, then we revert over to the terms of the SPV and we start distributing the principal. Do we have enough principal to satisfy the A? So uh, the notice that the A gets some interest and then principal, maybe it'll get some principal. And so we waterfall, we cascade all the way down. So as soon as we fail on the interest, then we start paying principal. And that's true whether we go to the left or to the right. So let's get back over to the past. So we've paid the, we've paid the interest to the A investors. Now, if we have enough to pay the B, then we keep passing and we go look at the bottom left there. We pay interest on the C and then we pay interest on the D and the E and the F until we get down to that equity tranche. Right. And then we start paying the principal, starting with the A and the B and so on. So there's the cash waterfall. That's a cascading approach. We have done that before. Credit enhancements, we've all also done this before. Notice the very top, improve the credit profile of the SPV to make the securitized assets more marketable. What does that mean, more marketable? We want them to be willing to pay more for it. So over collateralization, how about my Pink Panther Diamond example? We can get some insurance company to insure us. We can divide this up into uh, different slices or tranches. And, and remember, we're not going to be sitting in our office and saying, oh, I bet the tranche structured in this manner would really suit these people over there. No, what we do is we go to the other business units inside of the financial institution and say, hey, you're in contact every day with our investors. What do they want? And so you design the tranche so that you can market it to those people who have some kind of a pent up demand. And then of course, margins and excess spreads. We've talked about that before. Now, remember back in my original slide with the learning objectives, I said there are a couple of definitions that we probably haven't discussed too much. Here, here are some of them, delinquency ratios, default ratios and uh, monthly payment rates. Let's look at a quick example here so that you can see how to calculate these and then how to interpret. All right, so we've got an asset backed security that is supported by credit cards. All right, so we have outstanding credit card receivables of 60 million. Current receivables are 50 million, which means that we expect to get 50 million of that 60 million back in the relatively short time period. And then there are the past due. So over 30 days are six and a half million, over 60 days are another two and a half million, and then over 90 days is one million. And although some financial institutions might think that over 30 days might be their definition of delinquency, most banks tend to think of this uh, in over 90 days, so three months. I guess financial institutions figure that if you don't pay in three months, you're probably not going to pay. But over 30 days, I mean, anybody can, you know, cash flows go like this, right, for households. So almost anybody can, uh, can be delinquent over 30 days. And it's just a matter of maybe just forgetting. I, I got a bill from my uh, municipality saying, Dear Jim, why didn't you pay your quarterly uh, sewage and garbage bill last quarter? And I said to my wife, I didn't even remember to pay it. I somehow forgot. It's the first time in my life I never paid a bill on time. So I had to pay a little fee and double it, you know. So 30 days, 60 days, all right. You know, whenever I see someone have 30 days or 60 days, I always wonder, why not 29 days or why not 31 days? All right, look at the bottom of the table there. So uh, we received uh, one and a half million during May, and then we're going to write off 500,000. So let's go ahead and compute these ratios so that we can address those learning objectives. So delinquency ratio, there's the receivables over 30 days in the numerator. So a million over the total of 60 gives us 1.67% delinquency ratio. 
And then the default ratio is going to be uh, the actual amount of uh, credit card receivables that have been written off during the month of May. So there's the 500 divided by the same 60 million. So that's less than 1%. And then the NPR, the monthly payment rate, is going to be our 1.5 million over the 60 million. So notice that we divide by 60 million in each of those. So that gives us 2.5%. So looking at the mathematics there, and then let me just go back to that previous slide, you know, that delinquency ratio, there's a description of the 90 days. There's the default ratio, credit card receivables written off during that period. And then the MPR is the percent of monthly principal and interest payments, right? Divided by the total amount. So there are the definitions, there is the math. So you ought to be able to, you ought to be able to do that pretty quickly on an exam. Now for a mortgage-backed security, here, let me just go back here quickly. A mortgage-backed security, we're uh, we're less interested in doing things like computing a delinquency ratio or a default ratio or a monthly payment rate, although these, these are important. Of course, I don't want to ignore these for a mortgage-backed security. But what's even more important is this uh, debt service coverage ratio, which, as you can see, is just net operating income over the total debt service. And so look at the numerator. These are cash flows left after paying all of operating expenses. You know, this is kind of like what I teach my capital budgeting students about operating cash flow. The cash remaining after all expenses have been paid. And then you divide that by the total debt service, which are those costs related to servicing uh, the debt. And so this means interest and principal and any other obligations. And so the important uh, interpretation is uh, one of these ratios to be equal to one, right? If it's less than one, then the mortgages are not generating sufficient cash flows to cover those debt payments. And so really, this is just a ratio of, you know, what do you got versus what do you owe? Here are a couple of other definitions and some calculations that we'll have to do. Um, before we get to the top, let's look at the table down at the bottom. No, bottom. Notice we have five different bundles of mortgages with different principal amounts, 10 million all the way up to 22 million. And there are different coupon rates associated with each of those bundles. Because remember, what do mortgage rates do? They, they change every day. I mean, maybe not quite every day, but clearly they can change every day. And so the question then becomes, if we're putting these into a security and we have different amounts and we have different coupon rates, right? We have different interest rates associated with each of those mortgage bundles. Then what we're interested in is what is the coupon rate as it applies to the entire wheelbarrow, to the entire pool? And that's where we get into this concept of a weighted average coupon. So look at the bolded phrase at the top, the average gross interest rate of the underlying mortgages in a mortgage-backed security. And so look down at the bottom right, what does that read there? 6.9625, that is a weighted average coupon rate. So if you look in the green, all we're doing is weighting each of those coupons, seven and a half, eight, six, seven, and six and a half, by the fraction of the principal balance over the total. So if you sum those, you get 80. And so uh, there you go, using just some regular old math to calculate a weighted average. Clearly on an exam, if you add this five coupons and divide by five, that'll be a potential answer. And that's probably not the correct answer. Um, you know, I wish I could give you a shortcut in order to compute a weighted average. Although, let me get my calculator out here. If you look on, I can't see because I got, uh, I don't have my bifocals on. Look under the number six. You can see uh, an X bar W. That will help you compute a weighted average. It does kind of shorten your investment in computing a weighted average, uh, but not by much. Now, notice the difference between this table and the previous table. We have the same bundles. We have the same principal amounts. But now, instead of back here, coupon rates here, we've got uh, days until the bundle matures. 
And so what we're interested in is a weighted average maturity. So over in the green, we do the same kind of math and we get 259. So this is called a weighted average maturity. And this is the average number of months until the final payment. And of course, the higher the weighted average maturity, the longer it will take for all of the holdings in the portfolio to mature. And then we'll go ahead and calculate a weighted average life, which is going to be based on um, what your chapter calls a pool factor. And look at the equation there, outstanding principal balance over the original principal balance. So if the original principal balance is, is 100, right? And what do you do you, after the first year or so you you know maybe you owe 92 and then you owe and then you owe 87 and then you owe and then you owe so that pool factor you know it's not identical to the discount rate when computing present value but it's similar and so this uh, weighted average life is a function of that pool factor uh, summed by what we'll call you know some other kind of a principal dollar divided by that 365 here. Let me show you what I mean in a, in a table. So down the left-hand column, we have payment dates from 2013 out to 2018, right? And so there are the number of days. So that first one, we don't have three months. We just have 66 days, but then, but then we have three months. Some are 90, right? Some are 91, some are 92. And there's that pool factor. So it starts with one, right? Present value is one. And then we just kind of discount it 94, 90, 89, all the way down to an 18. And the way we compute that is look at those outstanding balances. So we start with about 90,000, or I'm sorry, 90 million. And during those, during those, that time period of 66 days, we've repaid a principal of about 5 million. So if you do the 84 divided by the 89, You'll get uh, you'll get the 94, and then you do the rest of the math over there in those final two columns, and you get the uh, weighted average life, which is 2.5747. So let's go back here. It's the average number of years that each principal dollar will be outstanding. Now with mortgages, of course there are going to be refinancing and there's going to be uh, prepayments. And so we need to worry about what happens with this prepayment risk, because if we're a mortgage backed investor, we need to worry about receiving our principal too fast. I mean, let's think about it. When do individuals refinance their mortgages? They refinance when interest rates fall. So we are receiving a higher interest payment based on that original high interest rate. And so we like that when interest rates fall. But then, then and uh, homeowners are going to refinance. So they're going to send us back the principal amount. It's not like we can't accept it, right? That's what they owe us, legal and binding contract. And so now we have to reinvest that at the lower rate. So prepayments are a huge deal in the mortgage-backed security market. So look at the, circle, the first circle point there. They can adversely affect the amount and timing of cash flows. All right, so how do we, how do we estimate, how do we determine, how do we manage uh, these prepayments? Two ways, so a conditional prepayment rate and the PSA, the Public Securities Association benchmark. All right, let me show you what I mean here. Uh, the conditional prepayment rate um, is a proportion of the loan's principal that is assumed, all right, right? So that's the important one, assumed to be paid off uh, ahead of time at each period, whether it's a refinancing or whether it's a sale of the house. Remember, people, people have mortgages and they move, right? This is always a percentage and it's always compounded a annually. So look at the bottom equation there. Um, there's the CPR, which is an annual rate. And so we need to um, convert that into a single monthly mortality rate, according to that formula there. Raise it to the 1 12th, right? You're kind of decompounding, so to speak, to go from an annual rate down to, uh, down to a monthly rate. 
Uh, look at the second circle point there. It's uh, estimated based on historical prepayment rates for past loans with similar characteristics and future economic prospects. All right, so you can obviously see the problems with using the CPR because it's based on history and it's based on not only default rates and prepayment rates and economic conditions repeating itself uh, into the future, but we also have to look at the simple fact that, of course, there are dynamics within the economy that are going to change both of those things. All right, so we're going to be using the, the risk here is to using this uh, single monthly mortality rate in conditions that were not present when that rate was computed. And for those individuals inside of those mortgages, they might have different personal financial scenarios that will change over time. Now, that's why the PSA benchmark is popular, because what it does is it assumes that this monthly repayment rate is not constant like the previous one, but that it gradually increases as the mortgage pool ages. And this makes a little bit more sense. So look at the, the, the second block point. So if we have a CPR of 0.2% for the first month, then we're going to assume that that increases over time. And so we're going to hit some maximum, let's say, of 6% after 30 months or, or 48 months or whatever it is. Here's just a quick illustration of the relationship between uh, time, right? There's months on the horizontal axis and that um, CPR in the vertical axis. What we're worried about is hitting the benchmark. So look in the middle, that red or rust colored 100 PSA. Um, that means that the prepayment experience is perfectly in line with the assumptions of the PSA model. And then, of course, the green line is above and the purple line is below. How about that learning objective on the subprime mortgage credit securitization process? And we've talked about this many, many times, right? Somebody comes in and applies for a mortgage. You do some credit checks. Boy, we spent some good time on credit scoring back in a previous chapter. So we make the loan. And so what we're going to do is we're going to divide this loan into, I mean, what we ought to do is divide this loan into, I don't know, 10 different parts, you know, high risk to low risk. But financial institutions tend to do this in two categories, prime loans in which those borrowers get the best rate and subprime loans in which the interest rate, it depends and is a function of the extra risk associated with the borrower's uh, uh, lack of tremendous financial stability. Now, of course, these prime loans can be sold to lots and lots of people, but uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and these government sponsored enterprises, they, they buy most of these things. Uh, the subprime loans, which don't meet those high credit quality requirements, can be sold to anybody else who wants them. Now, of course, there are going to be problems, right? Let's go back here. Um, you know, the prime loans are sold to the federal government, let's say. So the federal government gobbles up all of those low risk loans, and then it's left to the rest of us to purchase these subprime loans. So as subprime MBS investors, we need to make sure that we're aware, right? The important thing is to first identify the risk. And the only way that we can identify those risks is actually go into the financial institution and look at all the mortgages that make up that pool. Of course, we can't really do that, so we need to pay someone to do that for us. So as you can imagine, there are going to be conflicts and frictions and problems. And so let's go ahead and look through a couple of slides about potential frictions here between uh, two different groups of people that were listed on that previous slide. All right, how about the, mor the mortgagor and the originator? <laughs> Um, typical subprime borrower is not financially sophisticated 
and may lack the financial skills to analyze the borrowing alternatives tabled by the lender. Right. So this has really been the big criticism of, you know, the greedy Wall Street bankers uh, providing loans to individuals who really don't know what they're getting into. You know, when I have gone to the bank to uh, borrow money for a house, you know, I have a fairly good background in figuring out, uh, you know, here's my income and I can't afford to buy this big of a house that requires that kind of a mortgage payment. But uh, lots of people don't have my background or your background and they can be taken advantage of. How about the originator and the issuer? Now, let's think about this. You know, as a financial institution, what's our job? Accept deposits and make loans. So we need to make loans to those individuals and those businesses who are very likely to repay. But if we are, if we are in a scenario under which we know we're going to take those mortgages and put them into a pool and sell them, well, then we may not, uh, we may not be as honest as we would otherwise be. Uh, notice the bottom sentence. The originator may paint an overly positive financial condition of the borrower. How about the issuer and third parties? Ratings agencies, underwriters, you know, other financial institutions, insurance companies. So look, the issuer may keep higher credit quality notes to themselves while securitizing the lower quality notes. Boy, do we want to call them lemons? How about the servicer and the mortgagor? <laughs> You know, the, the servicer, uh, servicers are charged with making, you know, key decisions on delinquent loans, right? We talked about this before, 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. Um, you know, for delinquent loans, the mortgager may ha no longer have any incentive to maintain the property, right? Or keep those home insurance payments up to date. So if we're not insuring a delinquent property and it, and it falls to the ground for some reason, well, then that risk, which we thought was transferred to someone else, might, might be the risk of the, uh, of the servicer. How about the asset manager and the investor? All right, so the complexity of the securitization process. So um, lots of times we hire an asset manager so that we can find the best mortgage-backed security or asset-backed security. However, the investor may be unable to assess the manager's effort objectively and informatively. And how about the investor and ratings agencies, right? So um, this is one of the things that I have lamented about for many, many years when actually when I first when I first discovered this, probably when I was in graduate school, that it's not the bondholders or the investors that pay the ratings agencies. It's the issuer that pays the ratings agencies. And so there are all sorts of tremendous conflicts that arise when, uh, when you have this arrangement. And how about that very final learning objective, difference between predatory lending and predatory borrowing. And I, I want to make a comment here that applies to this slide, but it also applies to all these previous slides here. Notice a theme about these kind of conflicts and frictions, and that applies to this slide as well. Um, look, if you and I are agreeing to trade, right, and I've done this many times in the past, so we sign a forward contract to trade my trusted 12C financial calculator. And you agree to pay me $50 for this thing in 30 days, right? So there's our, our traditional derivative security. Well, what might happen in those 30 days? I may drop it. I may, I may break it. Uh, somehow I may take a sledgehammer to it, but you don't know that. And so all of these problems are really come back to uh, what I learned back in graduate school called asymmetry of information, right? And so one person in the transaction knows more about the value of the underlying asset than the other. And that can pretty much explain all of these issues that we've just talked about. And so here, the same thing with predatory lending. So look, unfair or abusive loan terms on the borrower, deceptive actions. They get into a house that they cannot afford or that they don't need, predatory lending. How about predatory borrowing? Look, 
I could say to you, if I if you're the financial institution and I come to you and say, oh, yeah, I, I have a million dollars and I, I may misrepresent on my mortgage application. And I, I love telling this story quickly and I'll do it as quickly as I can because we're wrapping this up. When I refinanced the current home that we're living in, I did this over the phone. I did not have to provide any documentation. I didn't have to provide a W-2. I didn't have to provide any kind of my income tax return. I didn't have to provide I didn't have to provide anything. This was at the height. This was 2004 or 2005. This was at the height of these no doc loans where I could have lied. I could have just said, yeah, I have a million dollars and my father's a wealthy, wealthy dude and he's going to lend me all, he's going to uh, leave all this money to him, to me when he dies. All right, so unfair terms, misrepresentative and uh oh boy motivated by expectation that houses housing prices will keep going up we know that doesn't happen and that takes us through these kind of two summary chapters so not much new in these two chapters and i hope you can agree that combining them was probably a good thing uh, so we did a little bit of a review of some topics that we've covered in the past. And then the new pop topics like the define and calculate those ratios, those were pretty straightforward. So you ought to be able to do those on an exam.